Welcome everyone to our Simple Steps to Improve Ductwork Installations webinar today. Um, you're going to learn how to install duct systems to ensure comfortable, healthy, and energy efficient homes. We're here today with Alex Boatzel and my name is Aubrey Yates. Uh, we're coming to you from Earth Advantage. Um, as a short introduction to Earth Advantage, um, mm -hmm. We uh, would love to, for you to check out our website, earthadvantage.org, if you're interested in finding out more information about what we have to offer. Um, we have lots of on-demand trainings available, um, which means that you can take them at your own pace whenever they're convenient to you. You can also join our mailing list um, so you can stay up to date on new trainings that we release and new opportunities. A lot of our trainings have opportunities to become um, accredited professionals, such as our Sustainable Homes Professional course has the extra step of becoming an SHP professional. You can become an ADU specialist, um, an accredited green appraiser, and um, lots of opportunities in that basket. Um, and then if you're interested in ADU, um, ADUs, you can check out our um, website solely on those offerings. I also want to take a moment to thank our partners from Better Built Northwest for generously supporting this training. Uh, here's a quick screenshot of Better Built Northwest's website where you can find a wide variety of trainings, tools, and resources to support both code and above code building, as well as directories that will help you search by zip code to find an energy rater, utility incentive program, certification program and other professionals in your local area. Overall, Better Built Northwest website is an excellent resource and we highly encourage you to take a look. I would love to introduce our instructor, Alex Boatsoul, who is head of residential innovations at Earth Advantage. He applies his 30 years of experience in sustainable design and construction to research and training, helping to make the benefits of high performance building available to everyone. Alex has a deep knowledge of building science and its real world applications and is an expert in low carbon building assemblies and systems. Since 2006, Alex has made meaningful contributions to some of the first lead for home, passive house, and zero energy projects in the Pacific Northwest, including the first commercial living building in Oregon and zero energy multifamily projects in the PNW. So thank you so much, Alex, for joining us today and for hosting uh, this webinar. I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Aubrey. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, so here's real quick couple learning objectives, you know, things we're trying to cover today. Um, explain importance of the correct installation of ductwork, right? So why is it important? Um, consider different materials uh, and the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then some of the best practices of installation and finally some, you know, like some additional resources for you. So again, <clears throat> I'm gonna go through the entire presentation probably and then we have plenty of time at the end uh, to cover questions so I, uh, if you can hold your questions for them that would be great okay um so first um i think i wanted to talk about what what is important for duct work installation but we won't cover just yet uh in this in this uh in this webinar so Load calculations are typically like we're really talking about design. Like what's important is that uh, that these ductworks are designed, um, but that not that doesn't necessarily happen always. But typically, the first step are load calculations, right? The size of the size of the equipment and duct system. We need to know how much heating and cooling we have to provide for each room in the home. And um, what you see here, the Air Conditioning Contractors of America or ACA Manual J load calculations. That's kind of the standard to follow for these. The next step would be equipment selection, right? So this is all in the design phase, right? Equipment selection, once we have the loads, we can size and select the equipment in manual S as the standard for the selection, right? Um, even, you know, not everyone is following manual J, uh, even people who are following manual J and are not technic not always using manual S. Um, and up to, you know, often that can uh, result in oversizing equipment, which um, has its challenges. Um, 
Um, and so that can uh, still have an impact on comfort and efficiency, um, specifically in in modern homes and modern home construction. So it's really kind of important to follow, follow all these steps in the design, manual J, manual S. And then finally, you know, once we have, you know, like our loads and um, our equipment selected, we can, you know, dive into duct design. And that is, um, is critical for the distribution, for the comfort, you know, and for an evenly heated home or cooled. Um, and then again, today we will focus on duct uh, systems installation specifically, but um, the best installation, you know, can make up bad design. So uh, um, good design is important. So all these steps here are important that ha typically happens before we get to the installation. So we're not covering it today. Um, but um, just so you know that if you are involved in the design process of homes and uh, HVAC systems, follow those manuals, uh, ideally. What's also probably uh, important to know is that we all have heard of the 45L tax credit and the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which will really increase incentives associated with uh, these uh, these designs um, and um, certain uh, HVAC equipment and installations. So uh, at that point, actually, you have to follow Energy Star, and if you do that, you will be required to you know provide these calculations and designs to unlock these tax credits, right? So there will be we probably want to see more and more um, of design systems just because of the fact that you know builders and trades uh, will be looking to to take advantage of these tax incentives. And we will have some resources in the end, um, again, like how to learn more about the tax credit um, and other resources. Okay, so proper installation, right? So we should probably start like, why is it important? Um, um, we will discuss uh, different materials, like I said, touch on their pros and cons, focus on simple steps, to ensure the systems perform as intended and then, um, you know, as hopefully they have been de designed. But um, let's recap why a proper installed ductwork system is critical, right? So comfort, above all, the homeowners want to be comfortable, right? That's why they're kind of hire us, that's the expectation. You know, they, they, they expect in, you know, like in, in new homes, you know, with new heating and cooling systems to be comfortable and will be, you know, very displeased if they are not, right? So um, how does a proper uh, installed duct system promote comfort? Well, how much heating and cooling each room needs to be comfortable depends on its size, the air of the exterior surfaces um, and the windows, right? So essentially how much heat are we losing to the outside determines how much heat we have to bring to each of these rooms. This demand um, or load is calculated using manual J, right? This is when we understand what we actually have to deliver to each of these rooms um, and how much need, how much air we need to deliver to make the room, uh, to satisfy that demand and make it comfortable. And duct sizes are selected based on how much air we need to deliver. And so improperly installed ducts impede that airflow. And, uh, and some spaces might not need, uh, might not get the air they need to be comfortable. So improperly ducts uh, also can be much noisier and impede comfort uh, that way. Um, and so both, right? So if you impede airflow and make it noisy, both of those will impact comfort. Utility cost, of course, you know, we, we talked about uh, how it impedes airflow. As a result, equipment will need to work harder it might use more energy than necessary. Um, think the other way around is correctly designed and installed ducts, save energy and lower utility bills. And then callbacks, right? So we can't forget that, that we have impeded airflow and the equipment needs to work harder. We have undue strain on the, um, on the equipment, right? And so we might see premature failure, which result in call callbacks. And then of course, again, Uncomfortable homeowners will ask you to come back and improve the system. So um, comfort is really what it's all about. And so sometimes quick decisions in the field might, um, you know, when we try to save time, might actually result in callbacks that take much more time than we initially tried to save. Right? 
And then happy, happy clients, also the best advertising, right? So word of mouth is still really important for us. So happy clients will make sure uh, that there's future clients as well. So heat pumps is a specifically, specifically a consideration. Heat pumps have much longer run times, you know, than like uh, gas uh, equipment. And so um, they perform, you know, they perform even better with lower static pressure, which is what we're talking about, um, which is the resistance. Okay. So, but so before we go, um, you know, like again, in uh, the actual installation, um, let's talk about the location where the duct work um, is installed. Location of the duct systems is often determined during the design of the project and either intentionally by making provisions for the duct runs or unfortunately too often ducts have them not, not be planned for and ducts have to be installed in unconditioned spaces, right? So like crawl space or attics, you know, that's very common. However, you can see from the picture um, what that does, right? Even though um, uh, location might often be predetermined, um, you know, like if installers arrive on site, we might already have selected um, where ductwork needs to be placed. Um, but it's worthwhile, you know, worthwhile to emphasize the importance of placing ducts inside conditioned space, right? And um, what are the benefits? Again, comfort, right? Ducts and psych makes home more comfortable by maintaining better control over air leakage and by reducing the amount of heat loss and heat gain those ducts are exposed to, right? So particularly in the attic, we see lot, you know, high temperature difference, like very hot in summer, very cold in winter. Um, and then you will improve indoor air quality by keeping the ducts away from those kind of unhospitable places like attics and crawl spaces where they can potentially, you know, pick up dust and dirt and pull it into the house. Utility cost, right? So if you, uh, even though we don't, like hang out in our ducts, it's actually, uh, it's important to recognize that the ducts um, carry conditioned air and, and, you know, so therefore they're really kind of part of our, our living space. And if you compare, right, walls have an insulation value for about, you know, like R19, let's say, but ducts are also only insulated to R8. Right? So we're extending our living space through these ducts and yet we're insulating it only like a third uh, to the level that we would insulate like living space. Uh, ducts also leak air. I mentioned that they are not sealed. <clears throat> if they're not sealed with mastic, the total heat loss from the duct system is around 15 to 20 percent, right? Just because they're in unconditioned space. And we will talk about duct sealing um, a little bit later. Callbacks, right? Um, bringing ducts inside decreases unwanted loss losses and gains, like loads that they have to pick up, resulting in smaller uh, equipment, shorter run times, longer life expectancy, fewer callbacks, right? So by now you have likely discovered a theme here. Um, Well-designed, placed and installed systems perform better in many regards and ensure healthier, more comfortable and happy occupants, right? So that makes sense you can tell um, we're affecting um, with proper installation and proper, you know, like sizing and locating the, the ducks in sight, we achieve all these goals that we really hope the system would perform. Here's a specific resource on, on the training um, of ducks in sight. Uh, it's a two hour training, it's on demand, no cost. So we will share these slides. You will have the, the link available um, at that point. And so I encourage you, if you, if you uh, wanna learn more about ducks in sight to do that with those resources. Okay, so before we dive into the specifics of proper like flex duct insulation, this is where we start right now. Let's pick up a little and discuss some of the physics of airflow and the problems we want to avoid, right? There are two main re reasons for poor or reduced airflow in duct systems and flex ducts specifically. And those are friction and turbulences. So, Friction, as air moves through a duct system, it rubs against duct walls, right? Slows down and the pressure drops. Uh, the more it rubs against uh, um, the walls, the more the air slows down. And the amount of friction depends on the duct material and the installation. There are a few other factors like, you know, how fast the air moves, how dirty the ducts are, but material and installation are what we're discussing today. 
So flex dock are significantly um, less smooth than rigid dock, right? We understand, like you've all seen the spirals, you can see it in the image here. Um, they, they're significantly less smooth than rigid ducting, which means they are starting with a much higher friction rate that is typically taken into account, right? So if it's designed and uh, the designer selects the material, um, you know, the software that's calculating this has the friction rate, understands that and can account that for. Um, however, improper uh, installation uh, <laughs> can significantly increase um, the friction. And we'll discuss how to avoid these issues. The second reason uh, for reduced airflow is turbulence, right? So turbulences predominantly happen during directional changes in there. So when we talk about directional changes, we of course talk about fittings. So let's pick this up later. We're gonna discuss fittings in more detail later. So, um, but it's important for us to understand we're really looking at to reduce friction and turbulences because that allows for the smooth delivery of the air which in turn gives you all these advantages we talked about early on. Um, <clears throat> so flex ducts can be very cost-effective materials, right? So uh, it's very popular and has uh, absolutely its place in the industry, but they have to be installed carefully to avoid these problems, uh, to avoid problems and issues um, that we will be discussing, right? Most common, very common problems are kinks, sharp turns, uh, duct runs that are too long, um, not support well, extra duct lengths that should have been cut off, poorly fastened and sealed connections, right? So these are all issues that we talk about today. Each one adds more of those frictions or turbulences, which can really add up to make the system perform much, uh, much um, poorer than we intended. Okay. So probably the most important installation concern is to fully extend the flex duct or the inner liner of an insulated flex, right? If a flexible duct is not fully extended, the friction rate increases proportionally uh, with the rate of compression. So what that means is you can see that in the, in the graphic to the right, right? If we have just 50% more compression, right? So we give it a little bit more slack, we double the friction rate, 30%, we quadruple the friction rate. So it's, it's really important to understand you know, like if we, you know, like it might be tempting to install a flex round too long to save time to cutting it to proper lengths, right? We're like, we have a piece of flex available. We just put it, install it without tighten it. Um, it really has an impact on performance. So um, like we talked about, each material has a, a friction rate um, that we take into account. But if you increase it this dramatically um, by leaving too much slack, we double or quadruple it. For a similar reason, right? Very similar uh, effect is if you don't support it um, properly, we see slag, right? We have, we create friction, additional friction that we try to avoid really to, to deliver that air properly. And so we have to support it every four feet. Um, and what we're trying to avoid is a sag beyond half an inch. Again, we understand that Flexstruct uh, has a, you know, a rougher surface inside. Um, it's overall, you know, uh, not rigid, you know, and so we're taking to that account, but if you add too much of these issues, um, we will really see challenges that make it poor, you know, for poor performing distribution system. And then, by the way, uh, these, these, uh, these images really uh, <clears throat> um, are from a brochure around flex ducting installations of the Air Diffusion Council. Um, really encourage you, if you work with flex duct a lot, uh, look into it. It's like a 20 page, 25 page pamphlet or so that gives you like some of the really important information, you know, that we're reviewing here. And so keep that handy and look at it, make sure you understand what's going on. But the, the key takeaways is that we're addressing here today. Um, so again, support every four feet. And obviously, if you run it across, you know, uh, trusses or joists, uh, that's sufficient as long as, you know, the spacing is appropriate. Um, but it's also important, like if we do have bends to support them ideally before and after to really make sure it's properly supported and also can't move out of place. And then important is like how we support it, right? Because we have the spiral in the duct 
Um, if we use like a wire or something, we can really choke it off. So that's why we want to see like uh, inch and a half wide straps at the minimum to really make sure when we support it that the weight doesn't collapse the duct. So now we have to make turns, right? So we talked about straight runs, keep it tight, you know, support it well, really important. Now we know obviously we have to turn and um, so we minimize additional friction by installing a tight, um, but um, who remembers, right? What was the other issue that we talked about besides the friction? Um, turbulences, right? So when changing direction of the flex duct, um, sound insulation becomes even more important because we minimize friction and turbulences. So this is kind of an awkward uh, way to describe it, but I think the the illustration here makes a good makes it makes a good makes it clear what we're trying to do, right? So the um, we want to keep the radius right of the inner the inner turn of the duct to the same diameter of the of that of the duct diameter, right? So you can see it in the in the in the diagram there. Um, given enough room, right? One of the probably um, uh, most often what we encounter in, in bad installations is that ducts are crushed when they're turned, right? It's really, it's they easily like collapse when we turn them. Um, it can be really difficult to keep like a good uh, turn or bent in the in the flex duct that will allow, you know, the air to um, cross that smoothly. So same is true, we talked about it before, if you try to go over certain, um, members, right? If you go over a truss or so and then down, you know, that that can quickly be, the bend can be too sharp. So um, for that reason, we wanted to really um, encourage you to consider at least potential, the potential to use rigid fittings, right? Rigid elbows, because they also obviously don't collapse it easily. They don't get stretched um, and they're much more likely to hold their shape. So, um, so let's uh, let's talk about let's talk about uh, fitting selections, right? So again, I, I'm going to say it many times, but I think it's because it's so important. Like the two reasons for poor and reduced airflow is friction and turbulences. Um, we you know discuss the friction results resulting from moving air rubbing against the surface of a duct, and so essentially. Turbulences are, in addition to rubbing against the surface, it also uh, rubs against itself and creates these turbulences. Um, and that obviously occurs when we turn direction. So like elbows, takeoffs, transition tees, all that creates turbulences. And we need to make, uh, we need to make sure to minimize those. So the image on this slide does a great job illustrating how the geometry of a fitting affects how much turbulences we see. You notice how um, a square fitting, especially uh, with a square throat, causes more turbulences than a rounded one, right? Uh, the throat is the inside of the elbow. Um, the outside we call the heel, right? So you can see like in this image here, turbulence is on the square throat. Um, and here it's like a rounded or curved throat. Uh, it feels kind of intuitive, right? The air can move around it in a much smoother fashion and creates less turbulences. So specifically in large square fittings, you know, turning veins um, can be specifically, uh, can specifically reduce turbulences. So we don't see turning veins often in single family projects, for example, but it's worth considering to reduce static pressure in the system. Um, and as more and more systems, again, as they get designed to manual D, we might see more of them, right? Uh, but what's important here is to really see, you know, like what the impact is by just the geometry of the fitting. Um, so how do we best express the difference in the amount of pressure drop a fitting can cause due to the turbulence and frictions, right? Take a look at the numbers on the bottom of the diagram. These numbers to express the pressure drop a fitting can cause as the equivalent lengths of straight ducting. So um, we will see on the left where we have the square fitting with the square throat, 
it's an equivalent of 39 linear feet of the length of the same duct. And then as the geometry improves going to the right, right, we're going to significantly improve that performance at the end. We're like, you know, with the turning range, we only add five feet. Five feet of what? It's equivalent length, right? So again, every fitting will add pressure to drop, to, will add pressure drop based on the geometry. The pressure drop is a result of friction and turbulences. And the amount of pressure drop can be expressed in equivalent lengths of straight duct of the same size, right? So again, you will hear, you will hear like a, a fitting has an equivalent length of 30 feet. That means uh, that fitting, one fitting adds as much friction loss or pressure drop to the entire system as like 30 feet of length, right? Of like straight duct. So you can find this equivalent length uh, for each type of fitting on the back of a ductulator, um, which might be used to select uh, um, duct sizes. Um, but then of course, manual D, like so ACRA's manual D also, this is where the page is taken from on the right, will have that um, for you. So as mentioned, I the duct system is designed and the equivalent lengths and associated pressure drop are accounted and carefully considered. Unfortunately, many duct systems are not designed yet, and the technician has to select the fittings in the field, especially if we find challenging structural obstacles or other reasons we might use additional fittings. Um, be, um, you know, be aware that this can be significantly, uh, add significantly static pressure and cross comfort issues, right? So um, you see here, uh, an elbow adds the equivalent static pressure of 30 feet to the run. So just like as an example, if you would use, if you have, you know, if we go on site and we find a beam, you know, like in a place where we're like, we're hoping to have a straight run and we go around it. Now we might be using four elbows, right? To get around it. So that would be 120 feet that we would be adding over maybe distance of, you know, physical distance of 20 feet. So select fittings carefully. Don't add fittings, you know, if there's other options. And don't substitute fittings with a, with a, you know more equivalent lengths, right? So if you if you for some reason have to swap out fittings um, because you know again site conditions don't allow for the installation of the fittings that were planned, make sure you take a look at this chart um, that you don't uh, you know unintentionally add a lot more equivalent lengths um, or you know friction pressure drop. Okay. Okay, so how do you avoid the some of these turbulences? Um, you know, we need fittings to change direction in the airflow uh, to distribute, you know, to all spaces. Um, and we know how fitting causes turbulences. You know, it takes about 18 to 24 inches for the air to smooth out and repressurize. So what we're what I mean by this is we saw, you know, like in the in the diagram, if you turn a corner, we create turbulences. And it takes about two feet for the air to like, okay, now I can, I'm straightened out and keep pushing down the duct. Um, and, and basically the pressure is, uh, you know, repressurized and straightened out. So that's where these two, this two foot rule comes from, right? Because it takes two feet to get back, you know, straightened out and pressurized. Um, the diagram in, illustrates this well, you know, like we want to really keep um, our takeoffs two feet apart on our trunk line, if you can, for that very reason, right? So that basically air can repressurize and then to be diverted again um, with minimal additional turbulences. With the, tame, the same is true for like separation between takeoffs and elbows, um, takeoffs and transitions, you know. The one exception probably that you can see here is it's okay to have them, you know, right across. That's okay. So. If they're right across, you know, we kind of have the same turbulence that we're addressing, but if we stagger them, ideally we stagger them two feet if we can. This also matters for the end cap, right? So the two foot uh, rule applies for the, for the last takeoff as well in the duct system. So keeping two feet between the end cap and the last takeoff allows the air to stay properly pressurized in the trunk line. So, Lots of physics going around this. And so that's why it's important 
that we understand the concept so that we can make adjustments um, or respond to it in the field if we have to. But it also should illustrate like why um, you know, design can be so important to keep that friction low. And then changes that we can make and you know that we make in the field might really impact the result. All right. So we talked a lot about so this is supply side, but let's talk a little bit about the returns, right? So because when um, we can provide, you know, provide sufficient air, conditioned air to each space in the house um, to you know increase the comfort. Um, but we will also have to bring it back, right? Um, however, the other aspect that we talked about earlier, besides you know bringing enough air, is like how do we deliver it? So if it's noisy, that's an important part of comfort of the comfort equation, and the placement of the return duct in that can you know uh, impact that uh, that system noise. So you can see here. We have a return, central air return, which makes a lot of sense. The central return is very cost-effective, easy to install, and in particular in like the modern open floor plan um, homes, you know, it makes sense to have a central return. But we can really connect the space um, to the noise of the blower if we don't do um, in mitigating measures, and it can be really simple, right? Just offsetting with two with two uh, elbows will you know, dramatically reduce the noise from the return. So, however, if we have a central return, that's great, that's a good strategy, but we really need to have a return strategy from all spaces, right? So um, generally, you know, central return is good and cost-effective, um, but we must have a clear pass from every room, you know, that we're supplying to, right? So we need to go, we, the air we supply into a room will pressurize the room if we can't return it. And so we have comfort issue, even if you have a great supply uh, run, if you don't bring it back, you know, we, we can't, you know, we can't supply enough air to the space, which means we, you know, typically for those return strategies like door undercuts as a strategy, right? Half or three quarter inch. It's lighter. It's like it's not always sufficient. Um, we also, you know, don't really have control about what happens to the gap. For example, there's a rug or a carpet or so. You know, that might block the door undercut. So it's not a very reliable way to make sure that we get our air back to the central return. Um, we also don't install the doors. We don't understand, you know, like really what's going on with that and and for if you have like two supplies to a room door on your cut will not be sufficient right so at that point we should really you know um employ some of these strategies here like a transfer grill or a jumper duct right to bring basically the air out of the room you know close to the but you know on its path to the central return these are not super common um, yet, or, or you know, only like in, in certain exceptions. But again, you know, we bringing in um, air more constantly, and so return pass is going to be more important. All right, so back to ceiling. So we, we talked about, you know, all the quality installation that we're doing, you know, to make sure like our air doesn't have no friction and turbulence, uh, gets smoothly delivered to each room, makes it comfortable, you know, can return um, without being noisy. However, if we don't see our ducts, you know, we might lose dramatically, um, um, uh, you know, our air on the way, which, you know, we, 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 do, we don't want to, you know, specifically, um, we want to bring it to the spaces that we're conditioned. So why do we seal? System efficiency, right? We want to make sure that we don't have to account for leaks and oversize our equipment, comfort. I know I've been saying it all along, comfort is like any aspect, any, any measure that we're talking about here to improve the duct system really has to do with making the home more comfortable. The air leakage that we're talking about by ceiling can, you know, dramatically increases, you know, like with a blower running, you know, we're actually forcing the air out of the duct into unconditioned spaces or spaces we're not planning to condition. 
And then combustion backdrafting is something that can happen depending on how leaky supplies and returns are. We might depressurize certain spaces. And if you're burning you know, gas, like a water heater or uh, other items, there might be backdrafting because we're creating negative pressure. So ceiling is critical. Um, here's some of the worst um, places, right, that we can talk about uh, where we need to seal. Like, for example, this image shows the takeoff of a, a plenum or trunk line. Um, and there, you know, there are some places, uh, you know, you can stick your finger in there. Uh, so we're losing a lot of air, um, unfortunately. So air handler plenums, filter racks, swivel elbows, branch takeoffs, right? Uh, all those, you know, we have to seal. Um, and, uh, and not only ideally, you know, like on the elbow, not just the connection, but each segment needs to be sealed to really make it fully sealed. Um, disconnected box is on the list here. And um, you'd be surprised how often we find those, particularly in like spaces, you know, like crawl spaces, attics, um, someone stepped, you know, or something else happened and had disconnected. So properly fastening and sealing will really reduce that from happening. So super important to seal the ducts. Uh, and it's also true to do that still, even if we're in conditioned space, right? We understand like, okay, if we're in the attic, we don't want to blow our hot air into the attic, but it's still true in conditioned space because if you lose the air, you know, like let's say, you know, in the soffit in the hallway, it's in the home, but it's not in the maybe the far away space that really was looking for that extra heat. Furnace ceiling, also something, you know, like that we don't, see always um, there's you know as you can see in this diagram there's many spots many locations that we want to seal we have a lot of parts that we're connecting that we want to make sure we seal it just imagine you know right around the blower is also where the pressure is you know the highest and we see most of the leaks as uh, right near like the the plenum the furnace filters we talked about filter boxes so seal those um, because it really improves the efficiency of the system. Again, like we can take into account all these losses and the friction and upsize the equipment. Um, but the idea is that we can, you know, minimize the size of equipment to make it more efficient most of the time. You know, when we don't have high loads, which is most of the, you know, 80% of the year, we need maybe some heating or some cooling. And, you know, equipment might, um, you know, run on a lower level and we would lose most of the air and, and so conditioning issues. Or we have too much friction and fans and equipment has worked too hard and um, we see premature failure. Okay. I think this is um, probably well understood in the industry. Uh, most of the time we see uh, using mastic, like mastic is used most of the time. However, um, probably everybody who has like learned about how to seal ducts has heard that the mastic needs to be nickel thick. And sometimes it's really interesting to see what people think a nickel is. Uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is it's not fun stuff to work with. Um, it's definitely, you know, nasty stuff that sticks to everything because it seals so well. And so there's hesitation off to use it. And tapes I use, they do not work the same way. Tapes lose adhesion over time. Um, mastic really sticks. Um, it's again, it's not fun to work with, but it really is effective. So with a few tricks, you know, like you see in this picture on the bottom, they're using gloves. You know, actually, I've seen using I've seen people using multiple gloves so that they can take off um, and and work again. But there's a few techniques, you know, that uh, help with the installation. But it's really super important to use mastic instead of tapes. And then uh, we talked about the inner liner of the insulated duct, right? So really the important connection is the inner liner that we see on the right um, with zip ties, uh, we can get that tight. And then the insulation is just gonna be taped to make that seal. Okay, um, so uh, the last part really um, that we're talking about um, is commissioning. And again, we don't have really a lot of time to go into this in detail, but um, the only way to really understand whether a system is performing the way we intend it, um, we can design it, 
um, and make uh, do everything right, and we can install it, make everything right. But we really should be commissioning it. So commissioning, what does it mean? It's um, you know checking refrigerant charge on equipment that has uh, that you know heat pumps. Uh, we measure the fan airflow across the air handler or the furnace, and then room by room airflow, which you know can look like the picture on the right. So we really want to make sure that okay, so our equipment is operating properly. Um, it's refrigerant is charged right. There's not there's enough in there, and our fan operates at the right speed. And remember, equipment comes like pre. Uh, set up, and that might not be um, what we need in our situation. So we have to make adjustments, and we don't really know if we don't test. And then room by air airflow can also make sense because when we're saying, you know, especially if we're kind of guessing, you know, from experience, they're saying, okay, this is a six inch run and a four inch run or eight inch run. That um, when we test, we actually understand how much. Um, how much are we getting there? And we can make adjustments to make sure uh, that we meet this. And 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 so what what is important here again? I want to just point this out again. The 45L tax credit requires project to be Energy Star certified or even the DOE Zero Energy Ready Homes. Right, short like we like to call that dozer. Uh, the doors of certification for both. You know, um, there's twenty five hundred and five thousand dollars available per home. But if you need to follow Energy Star, you need to design and you need to commission the system. It's required. So if that's of interest, you know, like there's a link here too that we will provide when we share this. Um, we want to make sure that there's other resources that you can you can follow up on to really understand how that works. Because you know, if you're a builder, you're going to be interested in that uh, tax credit. If you're a tradesperson, you know, the builder will ask you. Like how how do we unlock this tax credit? Can we make this work? Because the system we're going to have is compliance. So now we need to make the steps to provide the paperwork to really make that happen. So um, and that can you know that can offset quite a bit of you know potential extra cost for higher um, performing equipment. And so it's going to be a win win for everybody. Okay, that um, was actually that was my presentation. And so um, we're a little early, but that's great because it allows for a little bit more time for our questions. But before we dive into those, um, I think I hand it back to um, Aubrey for a yep. little bit more information. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, so real quick, um, before, yeah, like Alex said, before we dive into the Q&A portion of this webinar, um, we can go to that next slide. I have a little bit of information on our some other um, training opportunities. Uh, the big one that I want to tell you all about today is our Sustainable Homes Professional online course. Um, we offer this course um, to help develop the technical expertise to design and build high-performance homes. Um, it was originally offered in person. Um, and I think it was about 84 hours long, very robust. And since COVID, the pandemic, we have condensed it into a 15-hour um, on-demand online course uh, that includes training videos, site visit tours, live webinars, such as on the level or fill in the gap, which you can keep an eye out for um, later in this year. Also guest speaker presentations, product and technology demonstrations, a robust amount of continuing education credits, and also, like I mentioned earlier, the opportunity to earn the Sustainable Homes Professional designation. Uh, you can see on the screen our pricing tier. Um, and then on the next slide, we're actually really excited to offer two different discounts at this time. The first one is an $50 off if you sign up in a group of two or more. So if you and your colleague or your friend are interested in signing up together, you can use uh, this, this 
$50 off opportunity. The second one is uh, our $100 off. This is actually a special offer that is only going on through the end of March or on a first come first serve basis. We initially offered this to 20 individuals and there are about eight spots left at the moment. So if you are interested in this, we encourage you to reach out to us ASAP, most definitely before the end of March to take advantage of this opportunity. And lastly, I want to um, just provide you with this, the link to our uh, training page. It's on the screen. I will also put it in the chat right now. And then in addition to SHP, we have some really, really awesome, um, informative, no cost HVAC training opportunities. There's actually a live webinar, webinar coming up. Um, cost-effective HVAC strategies to meet new WSECR 2021. Um, this is on March 21st and is hosted by WSU Energy Program and presented by Mitsubishi. And then you'll see a variety of on-demand opportunities that can fit in with your schedule. Um, feel free to uh, check these out by visiting our website, our training page.